let me start uh, on a positive uh, note, because we are all lucky. Because we live in one of the most interesting times in history. Of three reasons, as I see it, there might be others. One is demography, the other one is technology, and the third one is identity. Never in the history of mankind has the composition of the world population changed more massively and faster than it is today. This creates huge opportunities, but also huge challenges. Let me just give you one example. In 1950, Europe, including Norway, <laughs> was, <laughs> was five times larger than Africa. In 2050, Africa will be five times larger than Europe. I could give you a number of other examples. This is unprecedented in the history of mankind. The second megatrend is technology, because never in the history of mankind has technological innovation changed as fast as it does now. And never in the history of mankind has technology changed the way we interact with each other than it does in our times. And it, it will continue and the speed will increase. The best example is what you have, I suppose everybody here, in your purse or in your pocket, namely the mobile phone. phone. In real time, you can follow nearly everything which is happening on the globe through that device. The third megatrend I mentioned is identity. This rapid change, which is happening globally, produces a situation where individuals are looking for meaning. How to define their identity, how to feel that they belong, how to define their place in life. This search for identity also produces politics, because people are looking for ideologies, for religions, for frames of reference which give them meaning. And this is also a huge challenge, because here there is a split. There is a, a, a traditional trend which goes back to um, traditional ideologies, to religiously based political ideological frames. And in some of these trends, we see the same features as, we, as our parents, at least my parents, saw in fascism, Nazism, Stalinism, namely autocratic ideologies which embraces violence and terrorism as legitimate political means. And this is one of the great challenges of tomorrow. This for a little, as a little backdrop for what I'm actually going to talk about. There is a competition, and we've heard some of it here, on is it the um, uh, Pacific relations, Asia, US, who's going to define this century? Is it the Atlantic dimension? Is it Eurasia, etc.? I do believe that the Middle East will keep its centrality in geopolitics. And I think it's a huge mistake to withdraw from the issues on the challenges that we face in the Middle East. However, the main dimensions of the conflict in the Middle East have changed, and changed fundamentally. Just a few years ago, it was the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict which was the defining dimension in nearly every single sub-conflict in this region. This has dramatically changed. Because now, what is defining the um, uh, um, central dimensions of the conflict in the Middle East is on the one side an axis which goes from the theocratic uh, Iran to, I would say, Baghdad, to Damascus, to the Bika Valley and Hezbollah. And on the other side, this is the axis, there is a block of countries who are perceiving that this and actually the fighting which is going on on the ground in Syria is a fight about the 
uh, dominance and hegemony of this region. And the reason why I say that the Middle East will uh, keep its centrality in global affairs is that there is no other conflict on the globe which touches both upon the hearts, the minds, and the pocketbooks of every single individual on the globe. Because there is no other conflict who has this dimension. The perception is on what I call the block side, which is uh, Turkey, Jordan, uh, it is the key Gulf states, it's France, the UK, and the US. Is, and particularly in the Gulf, the perception is that Iran is seeking dominance and hegemony over this region, and thereby creating a global power platform. This might be wrong, it might be right, but believe me, this is the perception in, throughout uh, uh, the Gulf. So, <clears throat> this has to be the focus in my opinion, if we look at global affairs today. Of course, there are myriads of other issues on every continent, but this not only has kept its centrality, but we must keep the focus on it because it concerns so much um, all of us. So, the center of gravity has switched from the Israeli-Arab conflict to the um, center of gravity which the conflict between the axis and the block um, represents. Let me here say just a few words about the nuclear issues and, and uh, Iran. To my mind, it's not the nuclear issues which is the key. The key is that if it's correct that the ambition is dominance and hegemony in this region, then the nuclear issues is only a tool for that. When I travel in many countries in the Arab world, nobody mentions Israel's assumed nuclear capacity because everybody knows it's for defensive purposes. But the belief there is that this is for offensive purposes and this is why the focus is there. And there's one other dimension here. That is that if Iran indeed gets a nuclear capacity, everybody else around will run for the same capacity which means that the NPT, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, which regulates these um, uh, uh, arrangements across the world, will collapse. And there will be chaos and anarchy in this field. Again, this is one of the many reasons for its um, centrality. On a parallel basis with this, this new grand game in the region, there is a game on the ground. And the, grain, the game on the ground is the uprisings in the Arab world. The revolts, the upheavals, um, directed against the old regimes. And the, two phenomena, uh, the three phenomena which I mentioned initially, in my opinion, explains what is happening. Because if we look at most of the Arab world, close to 50%, some 40%, of the population is below 25 years of age. Education has, has in, increased, but youth employment is skyrocketing. And particularly in countries we now see, uh, like Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and Libya. And if we look at the structural facts, none of us, at least I, did not uh, predict what was happening in these countries, um, including in, in, in Syria, of course. Uh, but if we look at the facts, the living conditions, the youth unemployment, the education, etc. This was predictable. When we look at um, Syria, if we go back to the uh, uh, 1980s, where tens of thousands of people were massacred uh, in the city of Hama, there isn't a single picture from Hama. One of the reasons why these uprisings could continue and proliferate are the new technologies that everybody could communicate via the internet, via your cell phone, etc. So it's the combination of the new technologies and the new demographies, which is an important backdrop for what was happening. But I do believe, uh, and I know Dominique and I, I think we have the same views here, is that the driving force here is not predominantly economic. 
its identity. I mean, that poor street vendor in Tunisia who put himself on fire and started this whole thing, he was not actually a very poor man. As street vendors uh, go, he had a decent income. But it was that the police said he needed to have a license, and the governor didn't want, or the governor's office didn't want to give him a license. That threatened his identity. And this is why he committed suicide and did the whole thing. This is, is more identity driven than ideology driven. It's pride, it's dignity which people are seeking, and they do not uh, tolerate the old. Uh, autocratic, um, the old autocratic regime. I know I'm running out of time. So let me end uh, by saying, uh, uh, Shimon Peres, who we are celebrating here today and yesterday, um, he, I once asked him, uh, Shimon, do you see light at the end of the tunnel? And he answered, yes, I see light at the end of the tunnel, but I see no tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> and what I do believe, and these are my last words, is that if we compared with revolutions, in Europe in 1848 and the ones in Eastern Europe in 1989, the reason why it by and large went well in Europe with the new countries was that the European Union could offer incentives for those who wanted to become members and come under the, the security umbrella of NATO, economic incentives, but then they had to qualify. Human rights, free elections, etc. And this was the reason why 1848, all the autocratic regimes, not all, but most of them came back, and even worse. I believe that we, if there is not um, established institutions in the Middle East, including Iran and Israel, uh, um, at the security dimension and at the economic dimension, we will end up like in 1848 and not 18, 1989. I can elaborate on this later. Thank you very much.